In this video, I'm going to break down how to approach an MRI of the brain. Reading these can kind of be stressful because there are a lot of different sequences, but once you figure out what each sequence does, it's much easier to go through them and know how to read them properly. There's a bunch of different sequences. The first one I'm gonna start with is what I have on the screen here, and that is the T1. And this is a sagittal view, so this is kind of looking at the brain from the side of the patient. The sagittal T1, I predominantly use to look at normal anatomy. So there's a few structures to point out on the midline sagittal. I'm not gonna do every single one, but I'm gonna do the major ones. First thing I look at is the corpus callosum that's here. There are a bunch of different diseases that can affect the corpus callosum. Some people don't develop with a corpus callosum and they have either dysgenesis or something called agenesis where it doesn't exist entirely. So that's something to look at first is the corpus callosum. You then have the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla making up the brain stem. You have the cerebellum here, which is responsible for maintaining our balance. When there's cerebellar pathology, patients manifest with something called ataxia. You have the pituitary down here. The pituitary is often a site of pathology. The pituitary adenoma is very common, and whether or not it actually matters, it depends on the size and if it's secreting anything. The prolactinoma is the famous one we learn about in medical school. So look at the pituitary on the sagittal T1 because that's something you want to diagnose if you see it. Another good thing to look at on the sagittal T1 is the bones, so you can see the calvarium here, and you can also see a lot of the cervical spine down here. On T1, you're looking for things that are dark within the bones, so hypo-intensity within the bones can indicate pathology. So when you're done looking at all the midline structures and looking at the brain, remember to look at the bones when you're on your T1. I'm going to move on to the next sequence. That is the axial T2. I admittedly don't really use the axial T2 that much. I typically like the flare, but there's a few things that you can look at in the axial T2. I think it's really good for the posterior fossa, which is the cerebellum. You can catch tiny cerebellar infarcts on the axial T2 a lot better than you can on some of the other sequences. Otherwise, for a lot of the rest of the brain, I tend to use the flare more, and we'll get to that next. But before we move on from the axial T2, a couple things you can also look at on the axial T2, and I think the sequence is best for are the orbits, orbits here, and then the sinuses. So you can catch sinus disease, be it fluid levels and like acute sinusitis. And of course you have your fungal sinusitis, which is a whole other story, and you're going to want intravenous contrast to evaluate for that. But your sinuses and your orbits are another good thing to look at on the axial T2. So here's our flare. Flare is a lot like the T2, except that the signal from the CSF is negated. So basically the CSF goes from being bright on your normal T2 to dark on flare. So flare is really good in looking at for pathology because anything with pathology is gonna turn up bright on flare generally. So I just switched over to a case where there is pathology on the flare. This is a GBM or glioblastoma tumor. So this is a primary CNS tumor. As you can see, there's a lot of brightness surrounding what's very obviously a mass here in the left cerebral hemisphere. Masses generally produce edema, so you would think, oh, all this brightness is edema related to the primary tumor. That's kind of true, kind of not true. The teaching is that all the brightness around the large mass is also tumor cells that are invading into the rest of the brain. And you can actually have tumor cells in brain that doesn't show up as bright, that just looks normal on imaging, but when you look at it under pathology, there's tumor elsewhere. So. This is the reason GBM or glioblastoma is a real problem, is that you can think you cut it all out, but you really don't because it can be all over the brain and it almost always recurs. So this is a good example of the flare helping us. Obviously this isn't a subtle case, but this is a good example of things that are pathologic show up bright on flare typically. So I'm back on our normal flare. And beyond stuff within the actual brain, extra axial collections will often show up on flare. So I look, track along the margins of the brain looking for subdural hematomas course an epidural hematoma but subarachnoid hemorrhage will show up as bright within the sulci. The flare sequence is a good sequence to look for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Meningitis would manifest as brightness within the sulci so there's other things you have to think about but flare is really just a good workhorse for looking for pathology in the brain. The next sequence to talk about is DWI. DWI most people when they think of DWI will think about strokes and that is true. DWI is the most sensitive sequence when looking for strokes. The DWI stands for diffusion weighted imaging and it's basically looking for areas where diffusion is hindered and those show up as bright and there's a lot of physics there that I don't particularly find interesting and I'm not going to get into but the point is on DWI pathology shows up as bright so you're looking for asymmetric pathology or asymmetric brightness in the cerebral hemispheres in the posterior fossa wherever it may be. Generally strokes 
cause diffusion restriction, which means they'll be bright. So a big stroke is going to be bright on diffusion. You can have tiny little punctate strokes. Of course, your lacunar type in barks will show up as bright as well. But beyond strokes, there are other things that show up as bright on diffusion weighted imaging. The first thing I want to talk about, and it's very common, is these tumors. So like the glioblastoma case I just showed, very, very cellular things also demonstrate diffusion restriction. So those will show up as bright. So a very cellular tumor will show up as bright on diffusion weighted imaging. Similarly, in abscess, you'll have diffusion restriction as well. So it's not just strokes. Other things can show up as bright on diffusion, but strokes is the big one. And a lot of times what we're looking for and the diffusion is good for ruling out. It's the most sensitive sequence again for looking for strokes. But the flare will also eventually show a stroke. Uh, but early on diffusion weighted imaging is going to be your best bet for a stroke. So now I'm on a case where there actually is a stroke. So this is a diffusion sequence. And as you can see, there is hyperintensity throughout the left cerebral hemisphere. This is a left middle cerebral artery territory infarct. So this is what a stroke would look like on DWI. So again, you're looking for something bright. This is in a vascular distribution. This is the middle cerebral artery distribution. So this is what a stroke is going to look like on a DWI scan. I'm going to talk just briefly about ADC because it relates directly to diffusion. ADC is the counterpart to diffusion. The purpose of the ADC map is to tell us if what we're seeing on diffusion is real. The thing you need to know is if something is bright on DWI, look on the ADC map it should be dark. So if it's dark on ADC, that means real diffusion restriction is happening. So what you're seeing on the DWI is real. There's something called T2 shine through. And that is, you can see something that's bright on DWI, but if it's also bright on ADC, it doesn't represent true restricted diffusion. So you can't interpret the hyperintensity as diffusion restriction, like in a stroke, if it is not also dark on ADC. The next sequence I want to talk about is called susceptibility weighted imaging. And to keep things short, this, this sequence is good at looking for blood, particularly old blood, which will show up as dark or as hypo intense. This is an example of a normal susceptibility weighted image of the brain. The things you can see on this that are pathologic are superficial siderosis, which is the sequela of prior subarachnoid hemorrhage. And you see too much darkness within the sulci where subarachnoid hemorrhage tends to go. The other thing you can see are micro hemorrhages. Those are commonly related to hypertension, but there's another common disease process called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which involves abnormal protein deposition within the cerebral arteries that leads to microhemorrhages. And I'm actually going to go over now to a case of cerebral amyloid angiopathy related hemorrhage. So this is what I was talking about when I say you look for dark things that represent blood on susceptibility. So this scan shows a ton of nodular foci of hypo intensity. And these are these cerebral microhemorrhages. And this is a patient with amyloidosis. So they have a ton of these hemorrhages. This is the most I've probably seen. And susceptibility is a great sequence to look for that type of pathology because this really pops out here. So that's one of the examples, and it's a common example of something you can see on susceptibility. So that is my basic approach to reading an MRI brain. Thank you so much for watching. Hope it helps you, and see you next time.